logic of education reform is to always call for more education reform. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Andrew Ferguson. He's a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, the author most recently of Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course in Getting His Kid Into College, and he's got a great story uh, in the uh, current Weekly Standard called The Common Core Commotion, Haven't We Seen This Movie Before? So you're writing about Common Core, uh, the Common Core Standards. It's the latest iteration of a big national educational standards reform. Tell us, right. before we get into it, Explain what Common Core is. Uh, well, I think it's actually called Common Core of uh, State Standards, but it's national right. standards. And why state standards would be called national standards is part of the whole mess that is involved there. What it is is the product of uh, a bunch of governors got together and hired some educational experts to go off into somewhere we don't know where and write. Jekyll Island, yeah. they, uh, you're wherever <laughs> the Fed met, right? Right, right. Um, probably. Kiowa Island yeah. or somewhere like that. But anyway, uh, and they came back with uh, what are called standards as opposed right. to curriculum. Now, right. what I didn't quite realize is that a national curriculum is actually prohibited by law. Mm -hmm. um, in the charter of the Department of Education, you're not allowed. It's it's grounds for blowing up the whole department uh, if if they. And so uh, the try Common Core curriculum. standards. I mean, they don't say, okay, in first grade you must teach George Washington did this, that, and the other thing. But they say by the end of first grade or the end of fifth grade or the end of high school, you should possess yeah. these sorts of capacities, these skills, um, being able to read with care and um, and outline what you've read. Uh, the, the math standards have various, very generalized um, uh, skills that you should be able to achieve without any content to them, which is one of the problems. They've got. But, but it's also that they couldn't put content in because if they did, then it would become a national curriculum. Right, and then, and then they would really have gotten it. Why did, the, why did the governors do this and then explain the intersection between the kind of governors coming together to push this and the Obama administration? Well, it's, uh, it's partly a, uh, a bastard child of this awful thing called No Child Left Behind that started under Bush with, with the aid of uh, Edward Kennedy and the, it was a great, people who really believe in bipartisanship really want to take a look at what bipartisanship produces. Um, and it was so bipartisan by the end of, as it was being implemented, everybody involved with it, it was saying, hey, I had nothing to do and with yeah, it. Well, yeah. of course, and one, one people say, well, the standards weren't high enough, the yeah. other people say you didn't put enough money right. into right. it and all that stuff. Anyway, it failed miserably uh, for reasons that are not terribly complicated that you'd guess is that they were supposed to test their students and they started lying about how well their students were doing because they got more money the better their students were doing. So the governors kind of were embarrassed into getting together and trying to do something where instead of having 50 different state standards you would have one or two sets of standards that everybody had to meet and then everybody would be happy and we would all become Shakespeare scholars. Well, and then the federal government gets involved because they can, I mean, they can't command anybody to do this, but they can direct right. a lot of money if you right. play ball with them. So talk a little right. bit about that. Well, the way that happened was, um, I mean, the way they became national standards was, you remember the great Obama stimulus in uh, 2009. I'm still waiting, yeah. actually, quite <laughs> honestly. You know, because among the most it, fascinating yeah. things about that is that the government could not even spend the money Fast, fast enough, enough the way, I right. mean, it failed at spending money that was going to start the economy. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one of the ways they were going to do it was give a whole bunch to the Department of Education, right. and they didn't quite know what to do with it, but they were big fans of this uh, idea of common standards. Right. So they took a pot of money, uh, close to a billion dollars, actually two and a half billion dollars, and said to the states, we're going to give you this, but you know, you have to meet a couple yeah. of conditions. And one of them is you should agree to a set of common standards right. among yourselves. And so, of course, the states, this is in the, the recession, yeah. uh, the states say, give us the money and we'll agree to the, whatever you tell us. You know, one of the things that motivates the idea of, of having kind of common standards uh, seems to be, you know, it's, it's a conservative goal. When, you know, conservatives want to tend to want to have a, a single language, a national language, they want to have a national history. Uh, national catechism, but then with school they become apoplectic and, and conservatives and libertarians and increasingly teachers unions are really anti-common core. But before we get to that, what is, you know, is there, what is bad about having 50 different states 
dictating what their kids should know, if not even more. I mean, in 1950, there were over 100,000 school districts in America. Now there's something like under 14,000. You know, that kind of consolidation is generally, we wouldn't say that's a good thing in business. Why, why do we want to consolidate an educational vision for K through 12 education, which you point out is something like $650 billion a year goes into the K through 12 system. Well, this is part of the logic of education reform. And the logic of education reform is to always call for more education reform. When it was decided that this was going to become a national priority back in the late 70s, early 80s, that we had to raise standards to raise test scores. And this starts the, in a way with, uh, uh, it was actually Jimmy Carter who created the Department of Education in 79. Right. Reagan, of course, ran on getting rid of it. That was one of his campaign planks. But then by the mid 80s, he had come up with uh, a nation at risk, yeah, which, which was helps a touch on. profoundly off. influential report saying that we were all going to hell in a handbasket. But it extends back beyond yeah. that. You know, in the 1950s, there was a f very, very big and influential book called uh, what Ivan knows that Johnny doesn't. And it was, why are these people, these little yeah. kids in the Soviet Union being able to build Sputnik, you know, and right. we can bear, all our kids are hanging out at the soda fountain oh, drinking yeah, Cokes. The, and, uh, chocolate you know, malts. Yeah, and, yeah oh Getting into God. chicky runs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. poodle skirts. <laughs> So, yeah, but, but anyway, so this is a long-standing yeah. part of kind of American self-flagellation. It's our right. schools are going to hell. And uh, there's just no way that you can have that kind of national sentiment without the mobilizing this huge federal apparatus and it's starting to impose so itself why do, on So why do, do conservatives dislike the idea of common core because it's the wrong core or because it's common? Uh, the, the, the answer to that is both. The, um, it's a scattershot objection among conservatives. A lot of it is based on misinformation. You know, you, you'll read the conservative uh, websites and blogs and they'll say common core mandates that fourth graders learn how to masturbate. Uh, so, you know, and that's just yeah. baloney. They, right. they, they've taken that out of a book that claims to be aligned with the common core. Right. So there are all these scare stories and urban legends right. going around. Uh, and that has created a lot of the uh, animosity towards it. The other thing is just the principled objection, which I yeah. think you're getting at, which is that you just cannot unify uh, standards and run roughshod over what has always been considered a local obligation, which is right. uh, schooling. The so, the, well, yeah, the, let me just, yeah. so, yeah, so why, are the, uh, why are the unions pissed now? Well, they weren't at the beginning uh, because as this money was rolling out from private foundations, the Gates Foundation, lots of other uh, places, uh, the unions were spending it and they were quite happy to receive it. Yeah, and, and talk a little bit about the role before we get to the union's objections now. Bill, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, along with the government, has been pumping lots of money. They, you know, they say we want better schools because better schools make better citizens or better employees is right. more like it. So we need to up our game. Um, you know, and then how do, how do they spend money and how are they dictating kind of the course of education? Well, to a, a, to a large extent, education reform in the United States is a creature of the Gates Foundation. He spent more than a billion dollars uh, on secondary and primary education in the last few years. He has a, a thing about training teachers. It's cost him $335 million over three years. Um, and it's borne absolutely no fruit whatsoever. Right. Um, but you, if he's seeding the ground with all this money, um, there are going to be a lot of people who are uh, happy to take it, and they're going to be happy to tell him what he wants to hear, which right. is that the Common Core is the way to go. Now, what's happening with the unions is that uh, basically, in certain places, Common Core is starting to bite. Common Core requires schools to test their kids according to a pre-approved standardized test, right. and then teachers are going to be held responsible for what those results are on those tests. The unions are fine with almost anything in education except for holding teachers accountable for how much right. learning is going on. Is it fair to, uh, I mean, or it, is there a fair way to judge how much a teacher, how much an impact a teacher has had on a student? Or are they right to be kind of like, you know, we know from the, the No Child Left Behind um, tests that a lot of districts, you know, would game things and they would screw around to make sure that the test scores were good. Are they, 
I mean, should we be sympathetic to teachers saying, look, you're, you're, you know, all, all I can do is get screwed on this? Yeah, sure. I, you know, and there are a lot of great teachers, but there are also a lot of really crappy teachers. And if you ever spend any time in an education school and you read the curriculums at these Department of Education and major universities, it's total crap. And it's, what, how is it? What do you mean by that? Because it focuses on the process of teaching rather than subject it, it's matter. A, it's all or, a sort of abstract theory right. about how to teach, not there's a little bit about how to teach, but not what you're going to teach kids. Right. So somebody will graduate with an education degree and be told to teach history, but they've never really learned anything about American history or right. European history or whatever yeah. it is. Uh, so they're teaching them how to teach by according to theory. And so as, as most people have now learned, you can get an education degree almost anywhere. It, right. You go to a large university and it's famous for the, that's right. the place where everybody gets dumped who can't right. really do anything else. Uh, and so we've had lots of teachers who are the product of that system. And, and now the teachers' unions are saying no to Common Core, or they're pushing back. They're, they, yes, more or less. Usually it's happening at the local level, like the Chicago, um, the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, is not officially against Common Core, uh, but the local chapter in Chicago, one of the largest, in fact, maybe the largest chapter of the AFT has now passed a resolution saying they don't want Common Core, or they don't want the test to be implemented. So uh, there is, what, about 45 states have, uh, have signed on to Common yeah. Core, and a number now are pulling out or are right. questioning it. Is this going to become kind of like the real ID, uh, if you remember the, or I guess it was, you know, years ago where there was going to be standardized, uh, you know, requirements for government IDs for driver's license, right. especially, that would tie into this, that, and the other thing. And as it actually approached implementation, it, you know, suddenly our states were like, hey, forget it, you right. know, I'm done with well, this. Well, and that's what happened with No Child Left Behind. By the time No Child Left Behind became uncomfortable for people, uh, it's just fallen apart, and so Common Core has risen to take its place. And the same thing, I can't see in a, uh, a way in which the same thing doesn't happen to Common Core, where the minute it starts to make people uncomfortable, it, it exists, but only as a husk. What, um, you know, but, and then something will arise to replace it, though, because oh, we're absolutely. already, there must be Generation 3000 or, you know, right, the, right, uh, right. whatever. I mean, there's like a new education reform plan being cooked up. Right, right. Pretty soon it will be, why does, uh, Juan, what does Juan Ho know that Johnny doesn't? It will be, you know, we'll use the Chinese as the great, but, and then it will yeah. be the Danes, or, you know, whatever it is. There will always be a reason to mobilize this huge apparatus is, of education. Is there experts. any reason to believe that Amer American education is definitely on per pupil basis, K through 12 since the early 70s has gone up, depending on who you listen to, at least twice. We're spending at least twice in real dollars per pupil, maybe as much as three. Re results are flat. So the schools are getting more expensive, but they're not necessarily getting worse. Is there a crisis in American education, or is one of the reasons why none of these programs work is because there really isn't a crisis, to be fair? Well, if there is a crisis, th th Test scores are pretty bad yeah. on an international scale. We do spend more than, by far, than per pupil than any other uh, uh, country in the world. The but problem wait, wait, that in healthcare, the fact that we spend more than any other country is a sign we have to cut spending. Yes, right. <laughs> this the, means we but have to spend. we have to spend more. In well, education. as I say, yeah. all reform. It's a logic of reform. All reform right. gets more reform. Yeah. The problem with it is, though, in identifying where, for example, test scores. You've got right outside here. You're in your palatial offices of reason. Um, you have some of the highest performing schools in the world. Right. Uh, ten blocks away, you have some of the worst performing schools in the world. So what do you do? You come into the District of Columbia and you impose some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, abstract program about how you're going to raise test scores. Well, what about the really good scores that right. come out of this and you know it's just there's no logic and this, to it. Uh, on the state level too I mean uh, you mentioned in your story are uh, there states like Massachusetts and Indiana and Utah that actually do extremely well in terms of uh, you know uh, student outcomes uh, across the board um, and it's not clear that applying those standards to other states is going to work at all. No, and the trail of cause effect even in places like uh, Massachusetts which has yeah. been very successful according to test scores it's not clear why they've been so successful. There, right. there are certain things they've done that would be worthy of emulation by other states, but nobody can trace. So, what. is there? Uh, do you have a preferred vision, or, or what? You know, what is the best way forward? Of everybody wants, at at the very least, if we're spending money on education, we want the dollars to be spent more efficiently or more effectively. What if? 
if kind of concentrating more curricular power or direction at the at the top isn't going to work what is what's a better way to go about actually instituting education that might make k through 12 schools not only more bearable for students and teachers, but actually better at transmitting knowledge. Yeah, well, I, I, what I would do is devolve the entire system. And I think that if there's ever going to be any remedy, it's going to be a bottom-up remedy. It'll be the result of a radically decentralized uh, curriculum and all, all those choices being made at local levels. You're still going to have a problem about low-scoring schools and there's the temptation to nationalize education because of that is going to be very hard to resist, which is why you're still going to get you know, thousands of education experts right. clamoring for reform. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. The story is the common core commotion. Haven't we seen this movie before? And we have, and it's we not have. a particularly good movie. We have. I'm walking uh, out next time. <laughs> that's right. Okay, we've been talking with Andrew Ferguson. He's a senior editor at the Weekly Standard author most recently of Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course and Getting His Kid Into College, and most recently in the new issue of the Weekly Standard, The Common Core Commotion. Haven't we seen this movie before, Andy? Thanks for talking with us. Thanks very much, Nick. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.